and welcome to this webinar on the management of unstable pelvic ring injuries, which is brought to you by ESTES, the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. We want to make this as interactive as possible, so please ask any questions as we go along through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll try and answer them during the webinar, either directly with a written reply or as part of the panel discussions. If there are a number of similar questions, we may answer them together. And if you answer, if you ask a particularly good question that we don't have time to answer, we may well uh, send you a written reply by email afterwards. There will also be a case presentation with a number of interactive polls during it. All voting will be anonymous, so please don't be reluctant to take part. We'd love to know what you think. We have four great international panelists who in order of presentation are Radko Komodina, Professor of Surgery at Celia Medical College in Slovenia, who will be talking about trauma-induced coagulopathy. Luke Lienen, Professor of Trauma, Intensive Care and Acute Surgery at UMC Utrecht in the Netherlands on the hemodynamically unstable pelvis. And finally, Simon Tiziani from Zurich University Hospital Trauma Clinic and Chris Papo, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Trauma at the University Hospital of Zurich in Switzerland, will be talking about fixation strategies and the Zurich algorithm. So I'm now going to hand over to my co-moderator, Shiva Gopal, to present the first case. Shiva. Uh, thank you very much, John, and good evening to everyone. Um, so we'll get on straight into the slides regarding this patient who is a 51-year-old male. He was a motorcyclist traveling at about 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers and hit a car, uh, the side of a car which pulled out in front of him. He was thrown 30 meters from his uh, motorcycle. The paramedics who attended to him at uh, 6.25 uh, in the evening recorded that his blood pressure was 88 over 54, pulse was 92, so slightly tachycardic. He was maintaining saturations at 96 and he had a GCS of 15 over 15. They noticed some tenderness around the pelvis, so they put on a pelvic binder. Deformity around the right knee stroke proximal tibia, so they splintered his right leg. They started uh, some IV crystalloids, gave him tranexamic acid, and um, they were still at the scene uh, at an another half an hour later, and his BP actually went down. They were unable to record his pressure and pulse rate had come down to 64. Uh, he was then airlifted and brought to the uh, recess, uh, uh, the emergency department recess room at about 13 minutes past seven. And airway was patient, as you can see, he was uh, respiratory rates were 14. He was maintaining 100% on oxygen, but we're not sure what, uh, what percentage of oxygen he was being given, but the chest was clear. Heart rate was 60 at the time. Blood pressure again had come up to 90 over 40. Little bit of trace of fluid in the pelvis. They had given 2.5 liters over the last, almost you could say 45 minutes that he was with the paramedics. GCS was still 15 pupils were reacting equally, were equal in reacting, and he was moving all limbs, at least at that stage. They noticed a deformed right wrist, a splinted right leg, and most importantly, there was blood at the urethral meatus during the survey that they carried out in recess. So they uh, started, a, a started transfusion, and I think because this is a webinar to manage a pelvic injury, but all other associated injuries as well, uh, so I think the next question is, what do we do with the blood at urethral meatus? Do all centers, all uh, emergency physicians carry out a digital rectal exam or they don't? What's okay. the model? Okay, Shiva, so we'll launch, launch a poll for this one. Um, and the question is very simple. When would you perform a rectal examination if a pelvic fracture is suspected? Would you do it during the primary survey if there's evidence of urethral injury? Would you do it during the secondary survey? Would you do it selectively before passing a urethral catheter? Would you only do it in the operating theater or would you never do a rectal examination at all? And people are still voting now. Okay, we'll stop it there. So most people would do it during the primary survey if there's evidence of a urethral injury. 
followed by the second most popular during the secondary survey. So can I ask the panel what we think about that, about when you would do a rectal examination in somebody with your suspected urethral injury and a pelvic fracture? I'm going to have to pick somebody out to do this, I think. So, um, Chris, when would you do a, a rectal examination? Well, I mean, um, the issue is um, the, um, you have to differentiate between, between uh, a, a simple and a complex pelvic fracture. The complex pelvic fracture, by definition, is one that uh, uh, is open and has uh, much more severe soft tissue injury. And most uh, importantly, if it is open and if there's a rectal uh, injury associated with it, um, the risk of sepsis, sears, and all the other secondary complications is skyrocketing. That's why, to my mind, it is crucial to do the, um, the rectal examination during the first uh, uh, survey, right in the emergency room. Okay. Luke, what would you say to that? Well, it depends very much on what, which, uh, which stage you are. If you have a, a patient in it, which is uh, in, in extremis, I would defer that to, to later. And um, I suspect an injury uh, anyhow when there's blood coming from uh, from the uh, from the anus. So um, I'll uh, do that later on when the, the time is right for that. Um, I'm preferably uh, in the OR when uh, we uh, are resuscitating further this patient in the OR. Okay, controversial topic. Um, Radko, what's your view? Might have lost Radko for a moment. Okay. Oh, Jonathan, do you hear me? Do you what, hear me? What's your view? Yes. Uh, in my hospital, we, the trauma surgeon, the who is uh, responsible. I think we've lost you for a moment, Radko. Okay. Let's let's move on to the uh, let's move on with the case presentation. Okay, so going back, uh, we've done the audience poll, and he was actually uh, transferred to the CT. We start immediately. Uh, so okay. uh, he at that stage he didn't have a digital rectal exam uh, in our center. He was instead transferred to CT scan because he was thought to be stable enough to undergo a trauma CT. And these are the findings of the CT scans, as you can see on the slide. Head and C spine were normal. He had injuries around his thorax, uh, left distal end of the clavicle with a glenoid fracture, uh, the heads of the left second to fifth ribs, then lateral side of the fifth to tenth ribs, a transverse process fracture of T7 again on the left side, and in the abdomen he had a small extraperitoneal hematoma overlying the sacral, sacral and ischial rectal, uh, ischial rectal fossa area. A small amount of intraperitoneal blood was seen in the pelvis and uh, pelvic injuries, which we'll uh, basically look at the x-rays shortly. Um, so is there anything that, John, you would want to ask the panelists or shall we keep moving on? I will, we'll move on at the moment. Thanks. Sheila. Okay. So he was brought back to, well, actually, to give you the full story, he actually dropped his pressures a little bit in the CT scanner. And again, they continued with the blood transfusion. He was then brought back into the recess suite where he underwent an X-ray. As you can see, there is a binder around his pelvis. Uh, we haven't put up the CT scans because we don't want to go into the intricacies of the actual pelvic injury, but the X-ray is pretty self-descriptive -descript there. So you can see what's happening to his pelvis despite the binder. And I'll move on to the next one. So we now come back. He's not had a digital rectal exam. There's still blood at the meatus. And um, he's, I would say, relatively stable. He's had the CT scan and the X-ray. We'll concentrate on the urethral injury. And I think John's going to run the next poll. Okay, so here's a patient in whom we suspect he's got a urethral injury. What would you do next? Would you attempt to pass a urethral catheter, do a retrograde urethrogram, put in a suprapubic catheter, or call a urologist?
Okay, interesting. <clears throat> Most people, almost half the audience would do a retrograde urethrogram. Um, current guidelines suggest that you put in a single, you have a single attempt at passing your urethral catheter. What does the panel feel about that? I would uh, agree with that. That's uh, that's no problem as long as you don't push it. Okay, Radko, do you uh, have an opinion that's different? You're on mute. Sorry, uh, I agree. Mm, it is. It depends. It depends uh, to the team available in the in the emergency department. When suspected ureter injury, we call urologist, and uh, he will uh, give the answer what to do. It is strongly uh, divided from from orthopedic trauma surgery. Okay, Simon, what would you do if you were there? Uh, we also try it once without pressure. If it fails, we just leave it. If the patient, uh, I mean, the patient has another problem right now, he's supposedly in shock. So he might not, not even um, secrete any urine for the next maybe hour or two, depends. So I don't think it's the primary objective to get a catheter in there right away at all costs. Um, you have to do something with the pelvis first. Sure. Okay, let's carry on with the case. So as Simon just said, uh, the urologist was, uh, they didn't uh, uh, attempt a pass by any of the emergency physicians at that stage. Uh, this was uh, 2013 and it's only yeah. since uh, that time that we've had now national guidelines that a single pass can be attempted. <laughs> so going on with the case, um, the urologist came and this was about an hour after the person, the patient had returned from the CT scan, so the urologist turned up and the urologist did the digital rectal examination. She couldn't feel the prostate and there was no blood on the finger, uh, which suggested that there was any kind of a rectal injury. And she attempted one pass urethral catheterization, which uh, she failed. Um, at that stage, it was noted that um, the BP and the systolic was hovering around the 80s to 90s mark. So the next, so again, as Simon just alluded to, the patient is still not stable. So there's persistent hypotension. So I'll hand over to John. Okay, so you've got a patient who now is been persistently hypotensive for quite a while. What would you do next? Would you start an inotrope, pack the pelvis, go to interventional radiology? Use an external fixator, an internal fixator, or none of the above. Okay. So most people would use an external fixator at this point, although it's fairly, fairly close between that interventional radiology and packing the pelvis. Chris, which of those would you do? And you're on mute, so. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. Um, well, I think it's, there's not a, a completely right or wrong answer um, because at this stage um, I'm, quest I'm like asking myself, do we know if the pelvis is the uh, only source of bleeding or within the first, let's say, half an hour or 34, uh, 5, uh, 50, 1 hour? how many minutes uh, all of a sudden this patient is deteriorating and with the binder on um, I think there should be uh, signs of stabilization so uh, I would probably uh, would like to know where the bleeding is coming from so I'm I would be tempted uh, to do, do inter interventional radiology just to find out or just to to visualize where 
this is an arterial bleeding that uh, uh, is a life-threatening emergency right away, uh, or is it just uh, some oozing from the back of the pelvis that uh, can be safely covered by packing? Okay, Luke, what would you say? Def definitely go to the OR and do a, do a packing. You have a binder already, so the mechanical stability is already there. Do the packing. If this, that uh, doesn't suffice, uh, consider with this uh, mechanism of injury uh, to extend it to a laparotomy. If that doesn't uh, find the bleeding, then you eventually could go to uh, interventional radiology. Uh, and take the time for the guys to get in during uh, the time you, that you stop the bleeding. Okay. So Shiva, what happened? Uh, well, he was uh, taken to interventional radiology. Hello, hello, hello. May, may, I, may I comment? Okay, sure. Please. Yes, Radko. Yes, uh, yes, we resuscitate in... I think we've lost you again, Radko. I'll give you a chance to come back and answer that question Please. later. Whole, okay. Whole body CT, you hear me? Yes, we do now. Yes, we would perform a whole body CT uh, angiography with, with uh, a radiologist. And after that, we, we would decide whether this hemorrhage is only the source in pelvis or the patient has some other injuries. Okay. Shiva, what do we do? What did you uh, do? Well, uh, the team on the day decided that uh, IR would uh, going to interventional radiology would probably be the best uh, option for this patient. Uh, and he was taken there and the radiologist carried this out um, and found that there were two small bleeders on the, around the pubic ramus belonging to the anterior division of the internal iliacs. On the right side, it was uh, embolized with gel foam. On the left side, they used a couple of nesters uh, to basically block the bleeders off. And uh, the urologist accompanied this patient, interestingly, to the IR suite, where she then carried out a retrograde urethrogram and there was no flow. And uh, she then went on to insert the suprapubic catheter. So two interventions took place in the IR suite. One was the actual embolization of the bleeders that were noted and a suprapubic catheter insertion. Okay. So carry on. And yep. uh, so that's the retrograde urethrogram view. And uh, as I mentioned, a suprapubic catheter was uh, inserted. So again, post IR, uh, the BP, they kept observing with resuscitative measures uh, intravenously as well, that, that the, the systolic blood pressure stayed around 80 to 90. So the question is, what next? I told you. <laughs> okay, let's see if the uh, audience agree. Start chemotherapy, pass the pelvic, the pelvis external fixation, internal fixation, or correct or the left of Okay. So the. There we go. So the overwhelming decision now is to pack the pelvis. Um, what about the position of the, the pelvic binder? Are we happy with that from those x-ray views that we've had? There might be any mileage in repositioning that or should we just go straight to theatre and back the pelvis? Luke, what do you think? It, it could be a little bit lower and then you have a more easy access to, uh, to the pelvis. It, it should be on the uh, trochanteric uh, uh, prominence. Okay. So well, we're... Yeah, right, yes. At the moment, patient probably needs serious uh, support with with the with the resuscitative uh, measures, with with uh, volume, with correcting later triad, and so on. And the the binder is the moment.
closed the pelvis, not, not very good, but it closed it. And if we, if interventional radiologist did his work well, now it's time for, 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 uh, for uh, treatment of, of coagulopathy, of uh, probably the patient is hypothermic and so on. So the patient needs intensive care. Okay. So we've got uh, most people wanting to take him to theater, possibly to external fix, and also to correct his coagulopathy. So, Shriva, what happened next? Uh, so he was actually taken to theater. The surgeons did accompany him, but uh, felt that he just needs some more mechanical stability. His pelvis wasn't packed. Uh, the intraoperative pictures, which we've not put up, uh, taken through image intensifier, actually show that the pelvis was better closed than this. Uh, it was a non-pelvic surgeon who was on call and uh, did an external fixator and uh, in theater. So we're talking about around three o'clock in the morning. And uh, continuing the story, actually, he stayed reasonably stable and actually at around 10 minutes to five in the morning. Uh, so this is uh, one o'clock in the morning. In, uh, he went to interventional radiology, three o'clock X-fix. And a couple of hours later, he was shifted to the HDU, the higher dependency unit, with a stable blood pressure around uh, around uh, 100 by 60. And he continued to stay around that figure. And therefore, a uh, decision was made not to pack the pelvis at all. Um, so he stayed with this external fixator as the temporary management of his pelvic injury until the pelvic surgeons could get to him. Would anybody still apply external fixators or you using, uh, or would anybody in the early hours of the morning would have gone ahead with pelvic packing and actual fixation? Maybe attempting an SI screw or something to stabilize the posterior pelvis? Uh, I, will, I will get, get to this uh, uh, later on, but I think sure. uh, posterior, posterior uh, stabilization with a C-clamp or something like that would, would be okay, but I could also uh, live very well with uh, with only the binder at this moment, uh, uh, as there is a reasonable close of the of the, the pelvis at that moment. So going on to the next uh, is actually digressing away from the pelvis for a little while. Uh, in terms of rib fractures, uh, management has changed significantly over the last uh, well, at least ten years, uh, and more and more of these are being fixed aiding lesser stay in ICU and earlier discharge, better pain control. So the CT thorax finding, just to recap, showed that there was a lateral end of the clavicle on the left side with a scapula, which involved mainly the glenoid, uh, heads of second to fifth ribs, lateral side of fifth to 10th ribs, and a transverse process of T7. So I'll bring John in to conduct the audience poll. So the question here is, how would you manage that? And you can have as many answers as you want, from the menu here. Okay. So most people will go for patient controlled analgesia uh, and a lot of other things from the menu there. 24% would go for rib fixation. Luke, what would you do? Depends a little bit on, on the general situation of the patient. I, I, with a, a blood pressure of 100, there's no, and, and on the ventilator, I suppose, there's possibly no, uh, probably no reason uh, to do a rib fixation at this moment. And we'll see in the, in the upcoming day how uh, the patient gets from the ventilator. And eventually, uh, it, there, there could be uh, something like a, a flail chest, uh, uh, but that we have to, uh, to assess uh, clinically. Okay, if you were going to leave it a few days, how long would you leave it before you thought it was too late? Our, we will more and more learn that, that uh, the sooner is the better. Um, and that's what we, what we go for, at least uh, uh, to have the decision within two days. Okay, 
Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I would uh, I would put the patient from Well, if I can, I may comment um, uh, if uh, if I can. Uh, the issue right here is that uh, we have just corrected uh, volume deficiency, and probably there's coagulopathy as well. Uh, but at this stage, uh, there was no ventilation problem. So I would agree absolutely with you. Uh, you have at least 48 to 72 hours to see uh, if uh, you know there has been. Um, a really bad uh, chest injury that uh, develops, uh, but at this stage, uh, I would say uh, unless there is a, a severe hemorrhage in that area, there's no need for a definitive fixation right now. Okay. Right, shall we move on? Yeah, so he basically didn't require ventilation and actually his uh, Hemodynamically, he stays stable uh, on the HTU. Uh, so basically, definitive plans for uh, managing the various fractures that he had sustained, including the pelvic injury, were made. Uh, he had further CT scans of his shoulder and knee, uh, and uh, he underwent fixations of his uh, pelvis, tibial, plasto, uh, distal radius fracture on the right side. The distal end of the clavicle and scapula um, were pretty much undisplaced, so they were treated non-operatively. But a tertiary survey on the high dependency unit showed that on the right side, where he had sustained an SI joint distracting injury, as well as the tibial plateau fracture, he had uh, a foot drop. And a nerve conduction test later on went on to show that it was a common peroneal nerve injury around the popliteal fossa stroke uh, head of fibula region, rather than from the pelvic area. And the urethral injury was quite a very complex one. and. Uh, there are certain specialized centers. So from Hull, he was transferred to another hospital in Sheffield. Uh, this is post-discharge for his urethral injury to be managed at around three months. So the pelvis, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Um, moving on to uh, giving uh, the mic back to John for the pelvic fixation uh, and an audience poll related to that. Final, final question for this. Um, it's a very simple one. Is anterior pelvic fixation contraindicated in the presence of a suprapubic catheter? Yes, no, maybe, or don't know. And the maybe really is under certain circumstances rather than a mm, don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Okay. So I'll stop there, and the vast majority, 63% feel that it isn't which is probably a good thing what happened to the patient Shiva? yeah uh we had the same uh uh conversation in the hospital that uh, suprapubic catheters are not a contraindication and he underwent uh, fixation of his uh, uh sacroiliac joint posteriorly and anteriorly did a pubic symphysis plating and an anterior column screw on the right side to give him a, a decent pelvic ring which was um, the only thing that I didn't fix was the left side uh, superior pubic ramus fracture, uh, but I felt that the ring was reasonably stable at that stage to not take the fixation all the way or put an anterior column screw on that side as well. So he healed uh, well, and with regard to his pelvis, he never had any problems. The only persistent long-term problem he had was his foot drop, which never recovered. Okay, thank you. Anybody like to comment on that? It's not compulsory. Okay, let's let's move on then, Radko, to your presentation on trauma-induced coagulopathy. So if you can stop showing the screen, Shiva. Yeah. Thank you. Trauma-induced coagulopathy plays a central role of uh, lateral triad. Post-traumatic bleeding remains the leading cause of potentially preventable death among injured patients. One third of all bleeding trauma patients show signs of coagulopathy at hospital admission. The early acute coagulopathy associated with traumatic injury is a multifactorial primary condition due to bleeding-induced shock, tissue 
injury-related thrombomodulin upregulation, uh, thrombin, thrombomodulin complex generation of activation of anticoagulant and fibrinolytic pathway. It is quite complicated scheme. Uh, the factors influencing coagulopathy are env environmental ones like uh, acidemia, hypothermia, dilution, hyperperfusion, coagulation factor consumption, and trauma and patient-related factors like severity of brain injury, age, genetic background, comorbidities, inflammation, and so on. And all these factors together uh, lead to the uh, start of the coagulopathy. The scheme is quite complicated with the end result, traumatic coagulopathy and weak problems for surgeons. In the recommendation number 10 of the European guidelines, recently published in uh, 2019, we recommend that a routine practice include the early and repeated monitoring of hemostasis uh, using either a, a, combined a combined traditional laboratory determination uh, this is PT, platelet counts, and uh, fibrinogen level, or point of care, PT and international normalized ratio, INR, or a viscoelastic method, or combination of these possibilities. We re recommend laboratory screening of patients treated or suspected of being treated with anticoagulant agents. Standard coagulation monitoring comprises early and repeated determination of PT, platelet counts, and fibrinogen level. PT and INR are often used interchangeably, despite being based on different comparative values. Acute traumatic coagulopathy affects 50% of patients with traumatic bleeding. Significantly associated with all cause deaths, hemorrhagic shock-associated deaths, venous thromboembolism, and multiple organ failure. Point of care monitors that assess the INR have improved the quality and ease of use. Conventional coagulation screens, PT and APTT, only provide information on levels of coagulation factor. Significantly shorter turnaround times are for them, and uh, for this uh, point of care PT INR tests, then for conventional laboratory testing, with time savings up to one hour. Rapid assessment of hemostasis to support clinical decision making using VEM is connected with this, and there is growing confidence in these methods, including also their use in children and adolescents, not only adult patients. The specific usefulness of viscoelastic measures in the detection of early fibrinolysis. Uh, viscoelastic measures only demonstrate hyperfibrinolytic traces in a minority of patients with traumatic bleeding. Viscoelastic measures is a poor detector of fibrinolytic activation which may be due to the production of soluble different factors, but the widespread use of tranexamic acid in trauma patients may be expected to counteract acute fibrinolysis. At this time, it is not possible to support viscoelastic measures as a superior option over conventional coagulation tests. Despite the widespread use of viscoelastic measures, their usefulness is still being evaluated. There is no evidence of the accuracy of thromb elastography and very little evidence to support the accuracy of ROTEM. Only limited evidence exists for observational studies which support the use of viscoelastic measures to diagnose early traumatic coagulopathy. In the recommendation number 23, we say, we recommend that monitoring and measures to support coagulation be initiated immediately upon hospital admission. It is essential to quickly determine the type and degree of coagulopathy in the individual patient. Early therapeutic intervention improves coagulation, reduces the need for transfusion of red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, platelets, reduces the incidence of post-traumatic multi-organ failure, shortens length of hospital stay, and may improve survival. 
There are two possible ways how to achieve this. One is early algorithm based and another one is uh, goal directed coagulation management. In recommendation number 24, we define what's initial coagulation resuscitation. In this initial management of patients with expected massive hemorrhage, we recommend one of the two following strategies, whether fresh frozen plasma versus red blood cells ratio of at least one to two as needed. And another one is albinogen concentrate and red blood cells. One to one to one ratio, what's that? Based on reports from the ongoing conflict in, in Iraq and recommended by US Army Army's Institute for, of Surgical Research. Recent guidelines from the Eastern Association uh, for the Surgery of Trauma from the United States recommend the transfusion of equal amounts of red blood cells, plasma, and platelets during the early empiric phase of resuscitation based on 37 studies, published studies. Other authors, mainly from Europe, strongly support the use of factor concentrate as the first line of initial coagulation resuscitation in patients with significant bleeding. There is a lack of good data to compare this strategy. What's the term initial resuscitation? It is a period between arrival in the emergency department and availability of results from coagulation monitoring. There are also potential advantages of support coagulation already in the pre-hospital setting, in the reanimobile, by the use of pre-taught plasma transfusion or administration of fabinogen. But these data are still in the, in the, in the process of research. This early and aggressive plasma transfusion reduces mon, uh, mortality. But optimal ratio between FFP and red blood cells and platelet and red blood cells ratio remain controversial. There is no difference in overall, overall survival between early administration of plasma platelets and red blood cells in ratio one to one to one versus one to one to two. More patients in the one to one to one group achieved so-called anatomic hemostasis and fewer died due to exanculation by 24 hours. Early use of platelets and high level of FFP use in the one to one to one group did not significantly increase rate of complication. There are some complications associated with FFP treatment, like transfusion associated co uh, coagulatory overload, AB0 uh, blood group incompatibility, there is possible transmission of infectious diseases, possible mild allergic reactions, and so on. Further controversy concerns the use of plasma to correct the decreased decreased fibrinogen levels associated with hemorrhagic shock. Low fibrinogen found, was found in 41% of patients hypotensive on admission. A resuscitation with a large amount of plasma is associated with dilution of red blood cells and platelets. And unless pre-taught plasma is available, plasma transfusion cannot be initiated in the same time as universal red blood cells transfusion. And during this interval, interval, the fibrinogen level is likely to be lower than desired. Initial levels be, uh, of fibrinogen uh, below the normal range are independently associated with higher in-hospital mortality. Survival improves with fibrinogen administration. That's why fibrinogen concentrate is widely used in Europe to rapidly restore fibrinogen levels. It has been proposed to administer, to administer two grams of fibrinogen to mimic the expected one-to-one -one ratio corresponding to the first four units of red blood cells and potentially correct hypofibrinogenemia if already present. This, this is happening while waiting for results of viscoelastic or laboratory tests. In the, recommend, in the recommendation number 25, we are talking about goal-directed therapy. We recommend that the resuscitation measures be continued using a goal-directed strategy 
guided by standard laboratory coagulation values and or or with viscoelastic measures. Viscoelastic test-based restrictive transfusion management may prevent unnecessary plasma and platelet transfusion, thereby reducing the risk of transfusion-related adverse events and transfusion-associated hospital costs. Thank you for your attention. Take a message in one sentence, Raka, would be what? It is uh, the treatment of uh, admittance and treat initial treatment of polytraumatized patient must be a team work. We, in, in different European countries, we have a different organization of uh, polytrauma treatment. But in, uh, in my country and in some other Central European countries, Orthopedic trauma surgeon works hand in hand with, with anesthesiologist and intensivist and interventional radiologist. So the surgeon must, the trauma surgeon must take care for coagulopathy and anesthesiologist must take care for unstable pelvic fracture. So holistic approach from the first uh, second on. Okay, Luke, do you use Rotem in uh, Utrecht? No, and we've published a paper on that that in, in our hands, it's uh, virtually useless. Uh, it's too late, too less, and doesn't give the information. Only very much later on when you have almost corrected everything, and uh, it could be uh, for a component uh, separated uh, uh, possibilities, but uh, not in the immediate phase. May I? Of course. It depends strongly to the organization of the of the hospital uh, service. We start with the with the rotem at the when we got the information from the pre-hospital unit uh, on the screen on the on the, doing the transportation to the hospital. We prepare everything, so the first sample is sent to 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 a rotem machine uh, in the first second when we start putting the clothes off and testing the stability of the lung bones and the pelvis. So the results are quicker than waiting for standard met methods. Do you use standard methods then, Luke, instead of a Rotem? Yes, we use uh, the, the usual uh, APTT, PT yeah. and uh, INR. Uh, and um, uh, certainly there are some drawbacks um, uh, with, with these measures, but they generally uh, inform us very well on, on the situation of the patient. A fibrotension is, an, is another one, but we, we preemptive start with a patient that is, that is uh, obviously bleeding with a, ma a massive transfusion protocol. So we are quite early and we have done a lot of rotums and we, have, have, uh, we always also have published on that. Uh, we have tried to uh, to evaluate this, and there was no added value at the moment. We took we took the uh, the rotum at that moment. Do you use rotum in Zurich? Uh, we use it, yes, but um, most often they only look at the victim and then give fibrinogen. And because you already gave the dramexamic acid, that would uh, or try to stop the hyperfibrinolysis. Um, but yeah. I mean, it's part of the algorithm, yeah. But um, I mean, you end up seeing like a line where the fit them is, and then you give fibrinogen, yeah. Okay, shall we move on to Luke, your presentation? Yes, uh, I'll share my uh, screen. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. So we, um, we have to talk about uh, hemodynamically unstable pelvic fractures and a lot of what has been uh, told about already uh, will be back in this, in this game. We, we are very well basic on this, uh, on this uh, because we think this, these patients are complicated enough 
So you should really have a very simple uh, algorithm and we'll, we'll get to this. Um, what we uh, see is uh, we have to realize that every patient with a severe pelvic fracture, as we have seen in the, in the earlier uh, patient we, we've seen, is a polytrauma patient from the onset. And you really have to realize that uh, there could be a lot of, uh, of torso injuries, uh, but also uh, other long bone, uh, bone fractures that could uh, add to the, to, the, to the problem and to the puzzle we have to solve uh, when this patient comes in. And from the start, as, as, as I said before, you really have to have a very simple, simple way of uh, treating these patients and evaluating these patients. And of course, the ATLS is basics uh, for everything. Um, it, it could be also an airway problem, a breathing problem, but, and then the pelvis comes in with, uh, with the circulation problem at that, uh, at that moment. So that really is, uh, is a, uh, a very complicated situation where you have to realize what's going on. If this patient is hemodynamically unstable, and that's what I told about uh, already, is this patient should have immediately a um, a, a multi a, a, uh, is a multiple injured patient that should have a massive transfusion protocol instituted right away. So we start from the beginning. If this patient has the well, in psychology they say the the, the gestalt of a patient that is uh, is really in trouble, we start this uh, massive transfusion protocol. So. When this patient is hemodynamically stable, we get to the CT scan, uh, mostly in non-operative management for the bleeding at least. If we have a blush, we do an angio angioembolization, which is a very basic and simple thing. In the case of secondary hemodynamic instability, we always can go in, uh, into damage control surgery if we want to. However, when the patient is hemodynamically instable, we have a massive uh, transfusion protocol, as we said before, and then we believe very much in mechanical stabilization. And uh, most times this solves the problem already uh, from the onset. However, if there is ongoing hemodynamic instability, when we, uh, we go for a preperitoneal packing, and we'll be back on that because 80% of other problems, the bleeding problems in the pelvis is, is uh, venous bleeding. If the patient stabilizes, we go for a CT scan, and I, can, I can't uh, emphasize this, um, not enough because you really have to know what's going on and a pen ct is one of the one of the things you really should have however if you uh, if the patient still is not stable then we have two things uh, uh, to do uh, that could be additional damage control and we'll be back on on this but also embolization could be a problem and then you go back to the to the icu and um, uh, have a ct scan when feasible in in these patients well, going through the, the whole of the problem, mechanical stabilization, but also redressing the form of the, um, of the, the pelvis and reducing the volume, I think, is, is something we really still in believe. This can be done very simple by uh, having the feet together. Of course, you have to be uh, aware that there could be a femoral fracture and then you, this is not very much of use. But this, uh, until now, is still the mechanical thing to go for. And this again, is a little bit too high. It should be lower, and then you even can do a, lap a laparotomy or a, uh, a simple uh, pelvic packing. Um, some other possibilities. This is a bilateral problem uh, on the dorsal side, uh, which is um, not easily uh, taken care of, but we are very much used to, uh, to the pelvic clamp, which we um, apply uh, a few times uh, a year which gives you a very good uh, um, uh, mechanical stabilization on the dorsal side. Uh, and from there, we're also on the, on the front side. And we perform this uh, in the ER already, and we do it uh, more or less blind. Um, the other possibility is an external fixation, which we normally do in the OR, and is some, uh, you, you need some more uh, stuff for that. So that's, that's uh, some, in, in our view, less, um, less quick. And then, of course, the extraperitoneal, uh, extraperitoneal packing, uh, which can be done with a little small incision just over the, uh, the pelvic rim. And in, uh, when the patient still has a bleeding, then we nine out of ten times go for a, a angiogram and have an embolization. And of course, when you have an unstable patient, 
um, we of course asked the uh, the angel guys to come in already because then they can be of help uh, in in any situation, and we take the time to uh, um, have this patient uh, um, done a preperitoneal packing and mechanical stabilization, and by the time we eventually need an embolization, those guys are in the house, and we can perform within uh, half an hour to an hour a an embolization. Well, there's uh, there has been some uh, some. Um, Pre, um, some preemptive uh, injury, uh, preemptive um, uh, material on this. Um, uh, Lee and, co and uh, uh, their uh, contributors uh, had a nice study which was published in Injury, where they saw that uh, extraperitoneal packing was faster and the treatment as such was uh, also um, uh, quicker um, in all. Uh, than the angiogram, and this was a, a real randomization uh, of those patients, and the um, well, the mortality and postoperative uh, red blood cell uh, count was not that uh, that different, but uh, both this did the job, but the extraperitoneal packing was uh, simply quicker. Uh, another thing you have to take care of is what, is, what was the mechanism, mechanism and what's the classification? Uh, we use the Burgess and Young classification because it, it has a clue on what is the, um, is the blood loss. Um, I don't ask you to evaluate this, but um, uh, Dalal has uh, evaluated this in, uh, before the 90s already and uh, saw that the associated injuries have a clue on the mortality and they said, well, the death following lateral compression injuries relate to the associated injuries, whereas death to the anterior posterior compression injuries relate to the severity of the pelvic injury. And this is what we see back in the uh, blood products and, and mortality in the, these different kinds of injuries. And the vicious beast is this uh, anterior compression injury where we see a huge amount of uh, blood products, but also a high mortality. And of course, these are older figures, but still holds true because it, it says something about the energy dissipation that comes into the into the pelvis. Another thing is that time uh, doesn't stand still. And we, of course, we have this resuscitation uh, differences. We have we have this hemostatic resuscitation, and this is a very nice uh, study from Oslo, where they have um, seen over time the reduction of the number of patients that they had to do an extraperitoneal uh, peritoneal uh, um, uh, packing. And you see that the transfusion goes up, but the numbers of the extraperitoneal packing goes down. And uh, what they uh, uh, generally say is that with increasing use of plasma, there's a decrease of red blood cells and extraperitoneal packing. So this resuscitation, way of resuscitation with high plasma is uh, something doing something good, and they actually also saw a reduction of the mortality due to uh, to bleeding to hemorrhage. Um, we still have to very well be aware that this is the complex uh, um, complex uh, vascularity in the in the pelvis, but the real vulnerable parts are the veins, the veins, and we have to be aware that eighty percent of that. What is bleeding are the veins, and so we still think that uh, peritoneal packing is uh, is the way to go. And and what we really have to be aware of that if we have severe pelvic fractures with an IAS of over three, over thirty percent has also an intra-abdominal injury, and this could be a liver injury, which uh, can con contribute also to uh, to the to the hemorrhage, of course. Bladder lesions, uh, we've seen already something about that, and a hollow viscous injury, which can be a very treacherous uh, uh, injury um, uh, in, the, in these kind of patients. Um, and we really have to be aware of this. Uh, some cases, as a patient with a fall from height, a binder on, and I think this is the right place to put, to put the binder on. And then, as you see, you have the possibility to get to, uh, to the pelvis without any problems. We put in this patient a C clamp. However, you already see one of the problems you can have that if you do this blindly, you can have a problem with with nerve damage. So we really should be aware of where to place this this thing. And the other thing is that the multiple multiple other injuries in this patient, and as you see, this vertebral injury 
also had a uh, spinal cord injury. So the hypotension was not only the pelvic bleeding, but also in this patient to the um, hypertension because of the uh, spinal cord injury. And then a definitive uh, fixation of the pelvis. In this case, it was done uh, from the dorsal side. Another case, um, a motorcycle accident, again, a binder, however, this time too high. Also a, a bilateral posterior problem, and you see uh, uh, also a severe an anterior problem. Um, mechanical stabilization again, however, this was a severely open uh, uh, problem uh, with also massive uh, uh, bleeding from the, from the pelvis, pelvis which, which was uh, tamponaded. And then after that, uh, we went to angio because of persistent hypertension. And uh, after angio embolization, we solved this, uh, this problem. And the patient went to the ICU for further resuscitation. And we had a, uh, a definitive treatment uh, later in, the, in time uh, with reconstruction of the ring. However, when time is right and when you have the possibilities with the right team at the right, uh, at the right place uh, in your operating uh, room. Another uh, case, uh, pre-hospital CPR. And here again, you see the problems you can have. It's not only the pelvis. This patient also has, of course, a severe uh, uh, vertical shear injury, uh, but also a magnitude of different other pro uh, problems with uh, a severe kidney injury, with a, uh, a liver injury, with also a, um, a diaphragm injury. So there are a lot of other things you have to take care of. And please, please, please be aware that a pelvic injury is not on its own. It's most times also another problem that's uh, it's hiding. And multimodality treatment and ongoing resuscitation is of utmost importance. And um, of course, Ratko Mel uh, 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 told it already, uh, this has to go hand in hand together with your operative treatment and resuscitation have to go hand in hand together with your team of anesthetists that, uh, that really has to help you through this, uh, this ordeal. Uh, another thing that we uh, heard uh, uh, last year during the AAST, uh, the guys from, uh, from Denver had another uh, very nice uh, other uh, adjunct to, um, uh, to, to surgery uh, where they had, uh, uh, they also do preperitoneal packing, but they also um, had Reboa as an adjunct. So not the sole treatment, but also as an adjunct to the treatment uh, of the uh, severe pelvic bleeding. Um, although there is no reduction in RBCs, they have a very, very nice series where they uh, have a huge um, uh, uh, better uh, survival rate uh, when uh, using this uh, method. Uh, probably this is one of the things we have to further explore to see whether our very severely injured patients can uh, have a bridge to surgery uh, by using the Reboa in the initial phase. Last case. Uh, a 35 year old female with a very severe injury and you see the uh, well the over uh, compression of uh, of this patient uh, the, she also had a very severe uh, soft tissue injury and you see the clamp on the frontal side of the uh, of the pelvis which reduced uh, the the pelvis which was uh, changed for a, for an external fixator and then the importance of a ct is very very well established in this case because as you see by putting on this uh, this uh, ventral uh, fixator we opened up the dorsal side which uh, uh, had us to do also a, a posterior fixation as you see here with um, a lot of causes uh, trying to pack the pelvis uh, in, in, the, in this case uh, with a later um, uh, we had to amputate uh, the left leg um, a frontal uh, uh, organization of the uh, uh, of the frontal side, a dorsal evaluation where we have some severe uh, um, nerve injuries, and a lumbar pelvine fixation, and also in this case to reconstruct uh, the ring. So, Mr. Chairman, pelvic injuries can be vicious injuries. Um, you really should consider the ABCs and expect really uh, collateral damage and act accordingly. And you really have to have a multidisciplinary team ready for the expert versatile care in these patients. And damage resuscitation, damage control resuscitation, more and more obvious special measures for bleeding control. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Luke, for that great tour de force, which I think has answered a lot of questions that people have raised during the um, during the previous presentations. Chris, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think uh, especially the last cases that you showed have been complex cases, um, very risky cases, and um, so yeah. Uh, very special, uh, but it can show, uh, what it shows is that you have a good team that uh, works together as a team. That's my impression. Okay, Radko. Great presentation, Luke, thank you. Uh, just comment from Slovenia, all three uh, trauma centers where pelvic fractures are treated, the A We've lost you again, Radko. Look, you seem to be one of the few people that actually has a C clamp and uses it. How often is that the case with your pelvic patients? As I said, it's it's rarely used. Um, I think um, last year we, we had five to put on, and uh, so that but it, it it's lesser and lesser because we with this pelvic binder and the the mm -hmm. The way we use it now, it, it, it obviates uh, very much the, the uh, situation. And I really think the, um, the other way of resuscitation uh, really uh, adds a lot to these, to these uh, patients because but then we don't need even um, to have this, this uh, dorsal, uh, uh, dorsal application. Okay, shall we move on, Chris, to your presentation? Certainly. <clears throat> so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, Not very well, Chris. Are you muted okay, on can, your computer? I can speak up if you like. That's no problem. Perfect. Hello? Okay. Is it better? So some of our experience, we summarized that the course that we did in January when the traveling was uh, still an option. And I'd like to start uh, my presentation with a, a case uh, of a young and healthy, pre previous year, a healthy uh, a young female. Um, it is uh, it's different from the case that we saw initially because uh, this lady, at 19 years of age, um, had isolated pelvic injury. Uh, on scene, um, she, uh, you can see that uh, she is in severe shock already. Uh, she also has a femur, but uh, uh, in, uh, other than the, the case that we sh uh, saw initially, no chest injury. And here are her initial x-rays. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, you can see the fast that was done and the severe dis displacement of the pelvis. Um, and um, now comes the issue of treatment, uh, because as you can see, this is a, a case uh, that was taken to uh, uh, not to a, a level one trauma center, but stayed at a level two. Um, somebody did a, 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 a laparotomy instead of fixing the pelvis and the laparotomy was negative. And so here you can see that uh, this patient is in continuous shock uh, in the DIC. Um, and then um, uh, they decided to uh, perform external fixation uh, right away. And you can see that there's uh, persistent instability and there's also uh, no reduction of the pelvis. Uh, the pelvis is, uh, continues to be widely open, as you can see on this graph. So then, <clears throat> um, embolization uh, was attempted. You can see uh, the proper x-ray uh, uh, right here. And there was uh, persistent instability, persistent requirement for transfusion and vasopressors, and 
and uh, that was uh, uh, seven hours after the injury when uh, eventually it was decided that the patient should be transferred. Uh, this is the patient uh, at the, uh, on arrival uh, at the level one trauma center on initial, on initial e uh, evaluation. You can see that uh, there's a almost spontaneous uh, um, skin breakdown uh, in the situation. The lactase ha is even higher than before. And uh, um, so at this stage, this patient was emergently taken to the operating room. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see, if I go back on the previous slide, you can see that the uh, frame was uh, uh, removed uh, and the sham spins were, were kept uh, for the time being. But uh, a lot of hematoma was taken out, pelvic tacking was done and was uh, um, uh, on the way back. Uh, a plate was put on. Uh, in this way, uh, this, this uh, pelvis was stabilized and uh, control of the bleeding was done. Um, and she actually, uh, because she was 19 and had no other uh, problem, problematic injuries, um, she was uh, 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 fine very soon afterwards. Um, I would like to also share some information with you because we have learned a lot of things over the years. Um, and uh, we have learned that the dogmatic approaches uh, are not really um, so great. Um, so basically, um, some people that uh, take every patient to the operating room uh, uh, may be wrong. Uh, certainly, uh, NGO uh, is the only solution that's not so great. Um, and um, if you only look at coagulopathy but leave this pelvis widely open the way it is, uh, has been on in this uh, very example, then it's probably not a good idea either. Yeah, somebody uh, called somebody during Oktoberfest to ask what uh, should be done. Uh, probably not a good idea either. Um, but we, we definitely feel that surgery should be part of the resuscitative management. And um, not, only, um, uh, um, not only fixation of the pelvic ring, but also um, uh, trying to get back the anatomy as best as you can while you are in the emergency situation. Uh, so whether that is a binder that you leave on, whether it's an x fix whether it's open packing, Circuit screws or ORF, um, we have uh, seen a combination of all of these uh, in the situation that I just described. And so there has been uh, a lot of changes. You can see this is a, uh, a paper from about 20 years ago where um, C clamp was used um, for um, patients with, uh, 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 with uh, disruption of the pelvis and you can see that it's the selected uh, patient rate and uh, I guess it was the high time of using the C-clamp. Uh, so here 15 years way, uh, later we looked at uh, um, the, the current use and uh, just like Luke Lena was saying, uh, we have observed that the use of the pelvic C-clamp uh, uh, went down and probably the binder is uh, one of the issues. Um, patients uh, appear at the hospital in a more stable condition and uh, it, that allows for more definitive fixation. And this directly leads to the second part of, uh, um, of, the, of the presentation, which will be done by Dr. Tiziani, who is the first author on uh, this publication. And uh, if, if it's okay, I would like to stop sharing my screen now and uh, we should uh, uh, go over to Dr. Tiziani for his uh, part of the talk. Thank you very much. So good evening, everybody. Let me just get it set up. So we'll also jump right into the slides um, after this demonstration of the evolution a bit of uh, at our clinic. Um, I'd like to talk to you about our algorithm today and our strategies to fix the unstable and sometimes hemodynamically unstable pelvic ring. 
so um, there are certain problems with um, with uh, high energy pelvic fractures and hemodynamic instability. Some are um, similar to the multiply injured patients. So should I do damage control? Can I go? Can I even think about the early definitive fixation? Can I maybe do both? Um, is there a way to to do both? And where is my instability? What do I need to control biomechanically? And this is especially true for the posterior pelvic ring and posterior pelvic ring instability. And the problem here is that overall you have almost nothing that no good perspective, uh, prospective data on fixation uh, on fixation strategies in the pelvic ring, be it uh, with um, with the damage control methods or um, and later also with the definitive procedures. So the um, Zurich algorithms that we um, displayed or published um, just now in injury um, basically goes through our um, approach to pelvic fractures. And it's very important that this is not seen as an isolated algorith uh, algorithm, uh, as already Professor Lin, uh, Lin told you that most often you have concomitant injuries. Um, so this can only be seen as a part of the management in the trauma bay. Also very important, uh, what also Professor Lin said, an algorithm can't be too, too complicated. Um, as soon as the patient is unstable and you have a complicated algorithm, you're going to fail. So first thing we do usually in the trauma bay, it's very rare today that the patient arrives without the pelvic binder. Uh, pelvic binders, um, in my opinion, are a very good way to control the pelvis initially, and it's also the reason why a lot of those patients um, arrive more stable uh, in the trauma bay. So you, you don't only have the patients in extremis, but you have a whole spectrum of, of stability in the trauma bay. The stable fractures you can almost always forget. There are rare instances where you have lateral compression fractures, type 1, where you have an arterial bleeding in the anterior pelvic ring. But if you don't suspect that, then uh, you should look elsewhere for your hemodynamic instability. If you have non-stable uh, pelvic ring injury, um, it's always important to know, do I, do I have a rotationally unstable pelvic ring or a vertically unstable pelvic ring? On our, uh, in our hospitals, we get a lot of uh, chompers as well. So we have a lot of vertical shear injuries, combined mechanisms. So we uh, often in hemodynamically unstable pelvic patients have um, posterior pelvic ring instability. So if the patient is, is unstable, we have, as the other guys already told you, we begin a resuscitation in the trauma bay. We use ROTEM and uh, we basically only consider angioembolization. If the patient initially stabilizes, maybe has a few micrograms of uh, vasopressor norepinephrine therapy a minute, uh, because the threshold of stability for us is pretty high because we have to go one floor up for the entry suite uh, so that's quite a, way, uh, a ways away from the OR. If the patient doesn't respond to uh, non-surgical resuscitation or as already as um, as a second um, as a second um, thing we already plan ahead uh, is we take him to the OR. We do damage control um, surgery. Uh, usually we uh, aim to fix the pelvis first. Um, if the pelvis is stable. Like already mentioned, in most of the cases, the patient stabilizes and you don't need to go ahead and uh, do pelvic packing. Uh, what we do a bit differently or a bit special in Zurich is we uh, use rescue screws, so percutaneous SI screws, also as a damage control um, instrument in the OR. Uh, of course, this is not aimed at patients that are completely unstable, but if you have vasopressor therapy, um, going, your patient is a bit unstable, you can use that as well. Um, in very, very severe cases, we might opt uh, to leave the binder in place, as already mentioned, uh, as an option. The problem here is that you need to take him back to the OR almost the same day. There are studies um, about pressure-related injuries after 24 hours. There's not really a agreed-upon break-off point how long you can um, keep the binder on but uh, you have to get rid of it at some point. Uh, rescue screws or anti-shock screws, like we use it, were first um, 
actually reported on as a case report by Gardner and uh, Rout in 2010 in the JLT, and they uh, advocated for um, percutaneous SI screws to be used similarly to a C-clamp. So you think, okay, that's going to take too long. Am I am I delaying my time to CTU uh, ICU? And there is a study uh, from our department where we looked at overall procedures around um, uh, SI screws and usually you have less than 20 minutes for a screw. Still, of course, longer than you would have with a C-clamp and you need to have more expertise, but it's not like you're gonna operate two hours, hopefully. Uh, we are about to collect our experience with those SI screws uh, that have been um, performed uh, recently more and more. We looked at all our um, um, high energy pelvic trauma that we treated with SI screws in the last 11 years, and 25 of them were unstable or hemodyna hemodynamically unstable. And the thing we asked was, was the quality of treatment the same as if we did the delayed one? So do we need to go back to the pelvis and do additional stabil stabilization? And uh, in, the, in the bottom one, you see that that's in fact the case. It might also be because the injuries that you see on the right are um, more severe than in the um, control. But you have in 12%, you have to go back and stabilize the posterior pelvic ring additionally. The re uh, revision rate of the SI screws that were rescue screws compared to, to the normal ones uh, was not significantly different, maybe a trend. So pros and cons of those rescue screws, it's relatively fast. If you think about it, could possibly be already the definitive solution. You, you gain a good control of, of the posterior pelvic ring. What we already have seen once or twice during this webinar is that an external fixation device in the front, like an X-fix, even if it's supra doubler, cannot control instability in the posterior pelvic ring. There are some good biomechanical studies about this as well. And as I said as well, it can be a definitive option. The, the, the cons are a bit that you need inlet and outlet views. So for example, if you have a team, a second team doing simultaneous clash, uh, crash lab proctomy, then you're gonna hit uh, the image intensifier into your colleague's head uh, while trying to get the uh, inlet view. So that's not really um, advised. And you of course need more um, expertise in pelvic um, uh, surgery to do than the C-clamp, which already demonstrated that here is really easy to do. And one thing that people sometimes forget is that you have a certain amount of people that have sacral dysplasia will, that will give you a very uncomfortable um, entry point into S1. So if you have time um, and you have and you manage to get a CT of the patient, look at your entry corridor for S1. If it's a very steep angle, he has a dysplasia. It, it can be that you cannot get the reduction right. It, it can be that you cannot hold the reduction. You, you're there one and a half hour doing the uh, SI screw when you should be on the ICU. Another thing that we started to do was using the internal fixator like an infix. So that's actually a spine um, implant that you use big pedicle screws in the back in the super uh, in the front in the super double region and then connect via a subcutaneous rod in the front as also a damage control method if you're used to it. External fixation and the C-clamp are mostly reserved for, for very unstable patients that almost cannot be stabilized with uh, fixation and uh, resuscitative, uh, resuscitative measures. And C-clamps um, are very rare at our house. I think last year we did one C-clamp so um, that's a very rare site with us. Um, the thing about the infix, um, there's a nice picture in the um, publication by Mary Mendel in 2012, you have a relatively high uh, risk of complication rate. The thing that 20 to 30% of people will get an infection of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And sometimes it can only be a loss of sensation at the uh, ventral thigh area, um, but in very bad cases, it can lead to immobilizing pain. Another thing is if you 
put the rod too far distally, you can compress femoral artery and vein, and you might have to take him back to the OR because he gets a compartment of the lower leg. You're again losing time uh, where, that you actually should be spending on the ICU. So I think the take home messages from our algorithms are that we try to control the bleeding through immediate mechanical fixation. And then we see whether we need to pack the pelvis or not. Angular embolization is something that is more reserved for patients that are semi-stable. Maybe they can be stabilized within the first phase, need low level of vas vasopressors and really have an arterial blush in the CT. Uh, we quite often use in the past or in the, in the recent future rescue screws to achieve those this, pos uh, this posterior stability. Um, we can all use, uh, we can also augment this with an anterior fixation like the infix that we can also use, for example, as a joystick to do the reduction of the posterior pelvic ring. And as I said before, we try to stay away from dogmas. Um, there's no really, not really one solution for every patient. Talk to your anesthetist, how stable is the patient? Where, are, where am I heading? Is it getting worse? what have we done to achieve the level of stability we have now and of course the main problem if in this field of acute surgery in, in high energy pelvic trauma is that really good data is missing at the moment so thank you for your attention thank you simon and thank you chris so essentially the take-home message from most of the talks that we've had today are the importance of a multi-team approach and a multifaceted approach to dealing with a patient with pelvic trauma. Uh, a couple of questions for you about your rescue screws. The first one is what sort of neurological complications do you get from those? Um, well, if <laughs> you can get the neurological complications if you set uh, if you uh, place the screw in the neuro neuroforamina as the as the uh, participant asked that's of course um, that's true right uh, you can have um, uh, problems with your um, sexual function as well if you have uh, if you hit s2 for example that's very annoying especially if the patient is young um, usually um, that's also very important that you look at the CT before. As I said, it's those patients where you get a very steep entry into S1, you increase your risk of hitting the L5 uh, route that just passes in front. Because if you have a wide canal that is perfect to put an SI screw in, that will, of course, uh, lower the threshold to put an SI screw in rather than uh, maybe do a C clamp. So it's also something that we try to, again, stay away from dogmas. If you have a bad pelvis to put a screw in, then don't put a screw in, put a C clamp. Okay, and following on for the C clamp, you, you said that you need more expertise to use a rescue screw, screw than to use a C clamp. And what a lot of people have said during this presentation is that actually C clamps are very, very rarely used, and a lot of people don't have experience with them anymore. Mm. How do you see that developing? Well, exactly like. Um, those people mentioned as well, if you use one C-clamp, there's going to be one resident a year that uses the C-clamp and all the other residents or fellows or attendings don't use them. So that starts at uh, stuff like if you get the C-clamp from your sterilization that it's put, uh, put together the wrong way, you have to realize that it's put together the wrong way. You have to know how you reduce, this, uh, reduce the fracture and retain it. So that's a problem, of course. Yeah, and we do, I, I of think, course, um, if I may interrupt uh, uh, and, and, and add a comment that is probably necessary to understand uh, where we are going. Um, I think what is absolutely crucial uh, is to have good visualization. So uh, what we are currently doing, uh, we are using the O-arm. Uh, number one, we have, there has to be there's a, a pelvic team uh, on backup call all the time. So um, it cannot happen that somebody that doesn't know how to do it uh, exactly well uh, will take care of this uh, kind of injury. And number two, we have the opportunity of using a, an OR intraoperatively. So we, can, we, uh, we will put in our wires um, for the reduction, then uh, check by OR. It only takes about a minute or two. Um, and then if, uh, if we didn't hit any 
uh, any neuroforam and then the screws uh, are actually nicely used to, to compress. So I think that is very crucial uh, as background information because um, you cannot do it blindly um, and you probably cannot do it in a patient that is uh, in extremis uh, because these patients um, uh, a lot of times have other issues as well. Okay, thank you, Chris. Luke, do you want to comment on that? Well, I fully agree. Um, the reason why we don't uh, acute um, uh, circles or screws is that we simply don't have the possibility to train everybody to be uh, uh, so fluent with it uh, that, that it's a safe option. So we try to do the most for the most and try to have everyone trained at least with the C-clamp. And that is, in our opinion, the, um, the most easy way to, to go. Um, and um, you really have to be, a, in my opinion, a somewhat of a pelvic expert to put in the SI screws. Um, is it not to be um, more fluent with it, but also most of, of my guys are really, um, uh, have some, well, let, some hesitation to put them in, in an acute situation, whereas a yelling anesthetist uh, and uh, some other guys are running around with uh, a neurosurgeon who wants to do something and so on. So we think putting in sacral screws, whether uh, if you should be very, very fluid with that uh, to do it is in, the, in this acute situation. Okay, so in other words, C-clamps are rare, but rescue screws will be even rarer. In my opinion, yes, uh, for the situation, we put in a lot of sacral screws, but we try to do that in a, in a very easy and well-controlled situation where we don't have the most optimal uh, um, imaging situation, unfortunately. So we really have to do that uh, on, on, a, on a very relaxed uh, basis. Ratko, would you like to comment? Well, as a matter of fact, we cannot afford in my hospital a pelvic a permanent uh, group to come to hospital uh, during the night. So we, we resuscitate with pelvic binder and external fixator. And uh, in case that there is uh, a trauma surgeon uh, who has experience with sacroiliac screws, this is one possibility, but we do not use SI screws as a uh, resuscitating procedure uh, uh, during the, the, the first uh, treatment. Okay. I think this is probably a good point to summarize what we've said this evening, which essentially can be brought down to the fact that you need to control the exsanguination, use a multidisciplinary, multimodality, multi-team approach in order to do that. Uh, and by doing that with the resources that are available, collecting your data, auditing what you do, you can improve patient outcomes. I think this is the time to say thank you to our panelists, Radko Komodina, Luke Lienen, Simon Tiziani and Chris Pape. Uh, to our support team, Diego Mariano and Mauro Zago. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and will join us again in two weeks' time for Nesta's webinar on direct peritoneal resuscitation and in four weeks for a webinar on fragility fractures of the pelvis. Details of all the webinars can be found on the events page of the Estes website, estesonline.org. Hope we'll see you then. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.